Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle, and welcome to the National Parks Expedition Challenge. Today, we are at Tumacockery National Historical Park in Tumacockery, Arizona, which is southern Arizona. In fact, we're only about 20 miles north of Mexico, and we're here today with Ranger Anita. Ranger Anita, thank you for the invitation. Um, this is a hidden gem. We had no idea, and we're so excited to be here today. How did you get to the national parks? Well, um, I, I grew up in Ohio. And there are national parks in Ohio, which I didn't realize at the time, but uh, my parents were both teachers. And so in the summer we would travel and uh, go to national parks. Then in college, I, I got an, edu um, an environmental studies degree. And I still, I, I was never imagining that you'd work in a park. It was right. just somewhere we went and hiked and camped. And, um, I got an internship at Yosemite National Park, which is in California, Yes, uh, one of the very famous parks. And uh, I got an, in, an internship there as an interpreter, which I had never heard of. And I learned that that is what you call the rangers who talk with the public, education, uh, visitor centers, tours, those people that you probably encounter most often, they're called interpreters. And I got an internship doing that and uh, found out that I could get paid to live in a park and learn stuff <laughs> and tell people about it. And oh, what could be cooler than that? Absolutely. So from Yosemite, where did you go? I, uh, I worked seasonal positions after that internship at Yosemite and at Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, Virginia. Yeah. and at Saguaro National Park up by Tucson, just very close to here. And, uh, and here at Tumacockery. And then I got a permanent job in, at Shenandoah and then finally ended up coming back here to Tumacockery for, for a permanent full-time job. And uh, over time, I moved into the position of being the, what we call the chief of interpretation, so the, the head of this group of people who, who does this work. Well, we are very excited to hear where you've been because we've visited all those places Excellent. and have filmed. Good. And in Ohio, we have been to um, Hopewell Culture and filmed and also Dayton Aviation um, Historical Park. So there are a lot of connections already with us and it's exciting to know that now you have ended up here. So tell us a little bit about this park. When did it get founded as a, par a national park site? Um, and just maybe some of your favorite things about the park. Okay. Uh, well, it is um, the main thing that the park was established to protect is, is the big obvious church structure that was built by the community that was here. Originally, the community that was here was O'otam. That's what they called themselves. That just means people in their language. And then uh, when Eusebio Francisco Kino came here in 1691, it, was, it became a mission, which meant that priests were coming and teaching people to be, you know, like Europeans. And so over time, it developed as a mission community. And eventually, finally around 1800, they started building that big obvious church. Um, it became a national monument in 1908. So it's, it's a pretty old park site. Um, it became a national historical park in 1990 then, when two other mission community locations were added to the park. So it grew and we're protecting two other churches, but they're, they're much more ruined, but two other places that were missions. Um, so things to do in the park. We have, we have a junior ranger program for kids. Nice. Which is kind of unique. It's a little, we call it a flip book. And um, you are, you're trying to find what is in the picture and learning a little bit and following kind of a storyline. And, and then when you come back, we make sure you learn something and you get your badge. Um, and we have a little sticker book version called Pancho Buscando for, uh, with our, with our uh, mascot, Pancho the Vermilion Flycatcher, taking you through the park for younger children. And you also have uh, people that come on site and do some demonstrations, right? We do. Uh, we have um, the tortilla makers are, are probably our most popular thing in the entire park. 
Um, so we have people that come and demonstrate the traditional, like this, making flour tortillas by hand, cooking them over a mesquite fire during the fall, winter, spring season. And then in the busiest visitor season, which is the right in the middle of the winter, that uh, then we have cultural demonstrators on weekends that also do other crafts, so basket weavers and potters and things like that. So that's really popular. Um, we have self-guided tour books for anybody at any time. We have a really nice hiking trail. It's a wonderful area for bird watching. So we're very popular for that. So there's a wide variety of things for different interests. Are there any animals around here that we might find? You might. And we have some really unique animals. Uh, we have had we have had a bear once or twice. We have had mountain lions pretty regularly. They stay away from the people along the river. Um, you're more likely to see maybe a javelina, which kind of looks like a pig but isn't. Or um, you could possibly see something like a ringtail or a kowati mundi, which are other unusual animals that usually stay away from people. But if you're on the trail, you could possibly see one of them. And uh, definitely the most exciting bird is the vermilion flycatcher, which is flaming bright red and black. And, and that is the, um, the motivation for your, your mascot that you have here. Yes, we, we developed a mascot, which has been very popular. And, uh, and it's Pancho, the vermilion flycatcher. And he wears, wears a um, hat like they would have been wearing at the time that the mission was active. So, so he reflects our natural environment and a bit of our history. Well, you said that one of your main attractions here was the church that we're seeing behind us. So one of the things we want to encourage our students to do is to learn more about this church, the history, the people, and the preservation of this place. So is there anyone here that we can talk to that would have some information about the preservation or the conservatory uh, piece of this church? Absolutely. For that, you definitely want to talk to Ranger Alex. And is he here today? He is. Well, great. Well, we're going we're gonna to check him out. We want to thank you so much for allowing us to come to your beautiful park. Again, a, a hidden gem, something you might not know that is here, but I definitely encourage um, students to get to learn more about this place and possibly when they're old enough to make their own decisions about traveling, that they can, can come and visit you here and find that vermilion flycatcher, right? Absolutely. All right. So we'll check it, uh, with Alex and see if he's around. Okay, great. Thanks. Ranger Alex, thank you so much for having us here today. You're welcome. Glad to be with you. Tell the kids, what was your journey to the national parks? Well, I've been here 10 years now. Um, before that, I was living in Philadelphia, working for uh, a university there. Um, my journey to the Park Service uh, has been gradual. It wasn't something dramatic that happened overnight. Um, when I was working in Philadelphia, we had a number of projects out in the Southwest, like National, uh, Mesa Verde National Park, El Moro National Monument, Pipe String National Monument. So these places, I was uh, participating in conservation, architectural conservation projects. And through the exposure over time, mostly in the summertime, I really got to appreciate the things that the Park Service was doing and when the job opened up here in Tumacacri, I applied for it and I got the job and here I am still. So you are an architectural conservationist? Conservator. Sort of? Conservator. Yes. What yeah. does that mean? You're our first one. It means, uh, it, it sounds very wordy and uh, specific, but it's really not. It, what it means is I'm a heritage steward. What that means is as a steward of cultural heritage, I get to conserve materials, and that's my specialty. And then, not just any material, but focusing on architecture. So, architectural conservator, uh, or you can just call me conservator. A lot of other people also call this profession preservationist, but preservationist is a broader term. Conservationist is used more for nature conservation, so we like to make some distinction, but um, conserv conservator, architectural conservator sits well with me. Or a rock star. I can call you that too, right? <laughs> I do. I deal with rocks, so, you, so that goes well. <laughs> well, so here at Tumacockery, 
What do you do specifically? Tell us the history of this place. The history of this place goes way back to late 1600s when the local native people, Tohono O'odham's ancestors, invited a Spanish priest from further south, uh, what is now currently Mexico, but at the time was part of Spanish Empire, the new, Me the new Spain. And we don't know all the, the specific reasons for inviting this priest, but he came and willingly spent time setting up various missions, about 20 of them in Arizona and Sonora, the northern part of Mexico. And all of those missions still, most of them, still use actively as local uh, focal point for the community uh, religiously. But Tumacacri has become a national park in 1908 actually eight years before the national park was established. Um, and over the year, he's had, had experienced various changes. Um, but to this day, it remains uh, a place very dear to the community, uh, not just immediate community members, but Native American groups who can trace their ancestors to this place uh, one way or another. So, and then we do a lot of active outreach to, to include them. So um, that's, a brief, that's a brief summary of the history of this place. That's good, and I like that this place is still relevant because you do include the community. You bring them back for events here. That is such an important part because, and that is why I'm in this field of architecture conservation, because buildings, sculptures, remains of buildings, are monuments, they are reminders of the things past. Some written down, some orally transmitted, some just archaeologically excavated. But, but a place that has significance in our contemporary life so that we can make better decisions of how to get along with other people, how to be a, a better community, how to cherish our past. That to me is very important and Tumakakri actually has over the last century and plus years played a very active role in that in this region and it also has a significance at the national level as well. So the key thing again is the relevancy um, and we I hope personally that my daughter uh, who's half Korean half Mexican also will cherish the history here that I that her dad worked here um, but not just because of that personal reason because this is an important part of this local area yeah and and such a great role model for humanity and and how we need to treat each other kindly um, when we issue our stem challenge today we're mm -hmm. going to be talking about preservation so tell us a little bit about the preservation of this these buildings here and what's happening to them and what you guys are doing now to make sure that this history is continued for your daughter's great-grandchildren. Right. So the really special part of this particular site is that most of the walls are built out of sun-dried mud bricks. So soil is universal everywhere. Anybody can find soil. It's cheap. It's very forgiving as a building material. Humanity have, has used this material for thousands of years, whether they dug a hole into a ground to live in a cave or build sod roofs over a little sloped cave. Uh, um, many, many different iterations of its use. You can fire them, but adobes, the, the, the sun-dried mud bricks are more commonly known as adobes in this area. And Adobes are a really amazing building blocks where even any, be any beginner can really get to utilize it to build their homes. Um, so the construction uh, and design of this particular monument utilize that capacity of adobes. That, and, and these are big blocks, almost two feet long, foot wide, four inches tall, and they are laid in such a way to a, such a height 
that it can support all that weight and still defy gravity. And just to throw in extra flourish, many arches inside, uh, a dome is topped with a dome, as you can see in the background, a barrel vault. So these are engineering know-hows that came from the European continent, the North African, and it goes all the way to Roman Empire, um, to Persian Empire, these builders of the same sun-dried mud bricks. So that's what you're seeing here today. And to top it off, you have painted finishes inside and on the outside that, that dignifies and makes that building sacred um, using different motifs that are available or, or popular at the time. So there is no other place in the world like this. Tumakakri, in its you know, combination of the use of adobes, painted finishes in this style and in this magnitude, this is a very special place. So one of the challenges for us is considering that this building was left abandoned in 1848 and became a federal monument in 1908, so this building was never finished. They had several financial problems. So the building construction took over time. They never got to finish it. And then it was left abandoned. So it became a ruin. So in the early history of this park, the leadership at the time decided the best way to honor and preserve this site is by keeping it as a ruin because if we try to fess with it, mess with it by interpreting non-existent blueprint, imagining how it would have looked like, but in reality never existed in its life history, they would be doing huge dishonor. So the, the pace, that attitude was set very early on, very fortunate for us to preserve it as a ruin. So preserving a kind of a, a fragile, earthen architecture made out of sun-dried adobes is actually a huge challenge. Um, if there is no earthquake and if, they, if there's no rain, no snow, then it would be fairly easy. But we do get rain, we do get snow, and this is in a distant way still in earthquake zone. So the problems of maintaining a, an earthen architecture ruin comes from having to protect the exposed adobes from the weather, the elements, um, watching out for the sudden shakes. So, um, so regular maintenance and taking preventive measures to against seismic events. These are our main challenges and that's what we continue to do today. So you will see, you will notice that there are no uh, exposed sun-dried mud bricks. That's because they are uh, protected by lime rendering, lime stucco. And more on this, te technical terms are available on our park website. Um, but the main idea is that to preserve a ruin, especially of the or earthen architecture type, continual monitoring, observation, maintenance, and really more importantly engaging the community that this is their place they have to have interest in it because when one stucco fails and adobes are exposed and they erodes away then it'll never go back so many things are running through my mind right now a couple of them are you guys have to be very observant so you're constantly researching, looking ahead to prepare for what could and may happen to this place to make sure that you are doing the preserving of it. The second thing is, I love that you decided that it wasn't about making it better. It was making it the way it is longer. That's you're right. preserving the story. So this isn't just a building. These aren't just dwellings. These are stories. Mm -hmm. If you listen carefully, mm -hmm. I feel that you could hear the stories of the people who once inhabited this place. And you're doing that by bringing in, you know, ancestors of those who lived here to continue to tell the story. 
the and the one thing I really took to my heart after working here for 10 years is that the knowledge of science engineering is important and that actually enables us to manage a site as a steward make a more scientific approach, systemic approach. But that has to be based on your motivation for doing it coming from your heart. Because if you don't care for the communities that care for this place, and if you say to them, I'm going to do this scientifically, you don't know science, I'll do it my way, all you're doing is just alienating the people who really matter in making this place a place. So you haven't really done anything. You've done a great disfavor. I work with a number of engineers, scientists, and, and, and that's a great privilege. And the message I have for the students who want to, let's say, oh, what, how big an adobe should I make to build a church this tall? How, what type of clay do I need to include in the soil to make a very strong, cohesive adobe? These are all important questions and challenges that they have to set for themselves. But they should also spend time, get to meet the people who call this place their home where their families spent time, where their grandparents got married, where their uncle dances during the fiesta. Because if you don't know their stories, which has nothing to do with science, if you don't know their stories, your use of knowledge could be severely misused and abused. So. That's what I want to say. The preparation for taking care of a place like this is not just solely on science, engineering, technology, and math. Uh, it has to come within that human-centered approach. And when you do that, you'll realize you've created such a more resilient community to sustain the heritage for the future. So that's going to lead us right into our STEM challenge. So kids, wow. So we always talk about how in life, if our passion intersects our purpose, then we know we're on the right trail. And with Ranger Alex today, we know that that's what's happened in his career. So here is your challenge. We're going to be using goal number 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. It's about the preservation of buildings, but it's also about the preservation of stories and making sure that we're telling the right stories so that our children's children will know and remember. We've always talked about how when you write something down, it's there for all to see. So as we're thinking about conservation and preservation of buildings like this, we want you to do a lot of research. So this is going to be research heavy. We want you to read the stories of Tumacockery. We want you to look at the different articles and videos that are on their website. Learn about the science behind the adobe. We want you to, to learn about the technology that they used even 100 years ago, 200, 300 years ago, to actually um, hoist this building up because we know technology is just a solution to a problem. It's something that makes something work easier for you. So do all the things. I would even encourage you to um, ask your teachers if you can bring in certain land materials around your school and see if you can create or model an adobe brick. But even more than that, we then want you to look around at your community. What stories are there in structures? Are these structures being preserved? Are there places in your communities, old gas stations or an old um, convenience store or maybe an old church that you learn about um, and find out the stories and then maybe give suggestions to the community on how they can preserve the stories and preserve the building. There is so much to learn here at Tumacockery, not just as Ranger Alex said, the science, technology, engineering, and math. 
but it's all about the communication and the collaboration between you and your community and between this park staff here and the community that makes this place historical. I can't wait to see what they come up with. So we're going to ask you to tag us at Dacia 92. Also, we're going to ask you to tag to McCockery because they want to see what you create. In fact, I think it's going to make Ranger Alex's heart, and he said heart first, so I'm going to do it now, feel even better to know that there are students, kids around the country who are going to learn about Tumacockery, but are also going to take the lessons learned here to make their community a better place, intersecting the stories and the mm. feelings of people into the structures that are standing. Because you're right, if we just use our head mm -hmm. and, and leave our heart out of it, that's what problems are around the world right now. We're not mm -hmm. using both to, to combine together. This was great. I love everything about this. There are some students out there that want your job, Ranger Alex, mm. because until today, they never knew that there was such a thing as architectural conservator with a heart, right? Mm -hmm. So if you could give any advice to our students, just look in that camera right there, what could they start doing now to prepare them for your particular job or a job in the park service? Well, my advice to you really is, is a summary of what I've gone through. And that is you really don't do stuff, don't study because uh, people tell you to do it. Um, I mean, at certain point, until certain point, yes, you <laughs> need to follow instructions because they have more life experience and hindsight. But after a certain point, you really want to pursue what you really like. These are things that when you wake up out of bed, you just want to go straight to it and don't look back and you can do it all day long. Well, that's a lot, and that's going to give you something to think about. Thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you, uh, thank you for being a preservationist of buildings and people and stories and relationships, because that's sort of what you are. We need to make sure that's in your resume also. I think your heart is really into this. So thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to work on this STEM challenge together. So this is Ranger Alex and Dr. Drizzle from Tumacockery National Historical Park, and we'll see you later.